Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. So I'm uh, Thibault, I'm the CTO of Crowdsec and I'm going to speak to you today about Crowdsec. Uh, Crowdsec is an open source software that intends to create an um, open source and participative uh, IDS and IPS to create CTI. So a bit of the why of the project, but it will become fairly obvious is uh, cybersecurity is uh, finally one of the sectors where throwing more money at the problem doesn't make it go away. We've seen uh, more and more recently bigger and or various small size company uh, being breached and sometimes with very uh, rather unsophisticated attacks or at least by attackers that had a very uh, fraction of the means for defense. And we only hear about the big ones and all the smaller ones that you might know, we never hear of them. But so there's still the issue and throwing more money at it, uh, at it doesn't solve the issue. And so a bit about the why is that, but even it might be obvious for, for some of you, but typically the time, the delay between the publication of a vulnerability and a weaponized exploit is usually a lot shorter than the delay between the publication of this vulnerability and the ability for everybody to upgrade uh, the impacted services. And we can, for example, take an example of the latest uh, Apache vulnerabilities, uh, and I think some people have uh, paid the price for it. And then there's a perimeter. Without even speaking about the current, uh, let's say, uh, sanitary context and everybody that has been to force work remotely, etc., with uh, public cloud SaaS and more or less modern architectures that is used for software. The uh, analogy of the castles that was sold by CISO for a while, at least for the last decade, is something that is definitely gone and is probably never going to come back again. And uh, last but not least, it's the money. Uh, money is always paying in favor of the attacker because people that are the real bad guys, they use very often stolen resources and tools that are either free or uh, stolen, but at least a fraction of the cost of the ones that are defended. And as everybody that uh, did pen test and then defense knows, when you attack, you only need to get right once to win, but when you defend, you need to get right everything else you use. And so given that it's a uh, castle strategy, is something that is never going to come back and we want to suggest a different approach that is really why we speak about the participative aspect. There's two, two things in this that first of all the IT resources are scattered across the internet. Any uh, medium, even medium sized companies have resources all over etc and we need to be able to protect uh, all of these assets. And, and this is how why the project becomes possible is that we do believe in the power of the crowd to try and fight off this issue. So somehow how it works. So what we do is that we are distributing a free and open source software that helps people to protect the infrastructure. It might share some simi similarities with the fail to ban for those of you that know it. And it has a bigger global uh, uh, aspect. So for this, how it works that the software itself is able to read logs. It can be logs from various sources. It can be log files, but it can be as well for more modern architectures like a CRUD, CRUD, sorry, cloud trail, uh, and more or less actually any stream of information that we can consider as logs. And then those logs, they are going to be uh, passed to be normalized, they are going to be enriched, for example, geolocalization and so on, before being matched against scenario. And this is where, besides the software being uh, open source, the community aspect starts to kick in, is that all these parsers, those scenarios and so on, they are part of a hub that is community driven, where people suggest some new changes. People want to, I don't know, there's this uh, funny Apache CV that comes out, people ask if we can get a scenario to detect it and so on. And so at this point, you have been able to pass and normalize your logs and with gem and my gem against scenario, so you are able to detect uh, attacks. And this is where we um, start to have uh, some strong opinions that we do believe that two populations facing the same issue are not going to want to react in the same way. For example, people dealing with uh, mail infrastructures will see it as a very often rather okay to uh, ban wall branches or wall part of the internet. But on the other hand, if you say the same thing to someone that is doing a transactional website or even worse e-commerce, they are going to see that something very frightening. And so we do believe that people need to be able to react how they want and even more importantly, at the level that they want in the infrastructure to the issue. For example, facing an issue in an attack, in some case, you might want to simply inject uh, captures 
uh, via your CDN, or you might want in a more classical way to blacklist them on your, or ban them on your firewall. But you might as well go down into applicative layers uh, to react differently and offer uh, broader ways of uh, reaction. And it's even more true when you speak to people that are facing not only purely technical issues, like someone trying to exploit a vulnerability, but more like business issues. Uh, this uh, typical example will be for all the people that are doing e-commerce that can be facing uh, attacks such as credit card stuffing, uh, credential stuffing, or even uh, bot scalping or product scalping. And, and this is where the uh, more important part of the project lies is that once the free and open source software allowed you to take a decision against an IP, a range, or whatever, unless you decided to deactivate it, you are going to share what we call the metadata of the sighting with the committee. You are going to share the IP that you blocked, the scenario for which you decided to block it, and the time stop, something that the software does automatically. And then this information is uh, computed on our side, mostly to deal with false positive and uh, poisoning, which I will come back to a bit later. And then they are going to be redistributed automatically and shared back with the committee. So that, for example, if you are running a web application with a CMS on the Apache or whatever, you are going, when you are going to report some SSH brute force or WordPress brute force or more generic uh, HTTP attacks, you are going in exchange somehow to get back lists of IPs that are very likely to attack you because we have seen them massively attacking people with similar configurations. And so this is why we say we are trying to build kind of the ways of uh, IP reputation is that we distribute free and open source software that allows people to protect the infrastructures. And while doing so, they collaborate and they participate to a bigger uh, CTI aspect that is being shared back uh, to the community so that the more users we have and the more participants, the better the protection and uh, the stronger the overall network strength is. So it's a local uh, IDS and IPS that uh, feeds the global CTI. Um, so from uh, past uh, experience, we have seen that even rather motivated attackers, so here I'm not speaking about uh, if uh, in a difference to the previous talk about like uh, APT and so on, but more like, you know, the background noise and the issues that 90% of the people are uh, mostly and actually facing is that for an attacker or a hacker, very often public IPs are one of the resources that is in uh, finite quantities. We have seen it in either technical, uh, it can be a dinner of service, or even uh, more like a business oriented attacks, such as attack against uh, e-commerce actors or bigger websites that uh, really rely on the website present to have that business running, is that once you manage to make them run out of IPs, then they have less and less means to attack and they need to get their hands on new IPs, etc. So it's a really finite resource for the attacker, and this is the level that we are trying to play on. Uh, and so all this, because it's an open source project, but uh, at the end we're a company, so our plan is rather clear that for us, this open source software is a mean and not the end. Our end game and our target is really to create the bigger CTI by having uh, a large number of users. And unlike some others, a project will consist of uh, running honeypots by having real users who are facing as well, uh, real attacks, I mean, attacks that are never going to be targeted at a honeypot. And this is typically also more like a business level uh, attacks that might be facing uh, websites, e-commerce actors, and so on. Um, so given that for us, uh, this open source software is uh, really a mean because our end target is really to create the largest and the most accurate CTI ever. So it's truly open source and there's like uh, no catch. So, it's as open source as it can be. MIT license is uh, very permissive and it's uh, very free and says like somehow uh, no strings uh, attached. And not only we do try to distribute open source software, but we are trying to create around us an ecosystem and a community where people are actually act actively contributing either in terms of uh, asking for support for new services, new scenarios, or as I spoke about uh, new bouncers to allow people to react at different level and in different way to a given attack. So uh, given that the demo is uh, often worth a lot of slides and I do believe the demo god will be with me, uh, we'll jump directly uh, into a demonstration. So you should now be seeing uh, two terminals. So the upper one is going to be the defender, the one where we are going to uh, deploy a project and the bottom one is going to be used to simulate some attacks. 
So this is a very standard uh, Linux machines, like uh, most of you already uh, have some running data centers with the uh, Nginx web server, uh, SSH, and so on. So uh, we are going to uh, install CrowdSec. And one of the key points of CrowdSec is that we try to have a technical barrier that is as low as possible. One of the promises that we want to make is that a system administrator that is able to apt get install CrowdSec on a machine should be able to uh, get a significant and something that it can uh, visualize improvement of uh, security. Um, so here uh, I uh, installed uh, CrowdSec and as we can see, CrowdSec detected the services that are present on the machine. So here it shows that we have Nginx running, it found out the logs, we have SSHD running, found out the logs, and that it's a Linux service. And along this, it installed what we call collection. So a collection is a current ensemble of configurations, so typically parsers and scenarios that allow you to either cover a technical scope or help you to address a given like a technical uh, issue. So just doing this uh, setup of a project is uh, uh, over. And so uh, we are going to uh, perform an attack on our server. So let me to the IP and we are going to have a look uh, at the log of the uh, project. Um, so I'm going to uh, run a good uh, old Nikto uh, targeting my web server. So uh, for those that, uh, uh, sorry. Leftover of the previous installation, I need to remove this. Okay, sorry. So uh, I'm going to uh, launch a web scan um, on uh, my uh, web server, and what is going to happen is that CrowdSec simply out of the box uh, will be able to. Uh, detect those attacks. So here, typically, so Nikto is a web app application in a scanner that is not very sophisticated, but has a typical behavior of a web uh, application in a scanner. And here, we can see that uh, my IP, the IP I used to uh, attack, uh, is this one, um, is being uh, triggered for performing like a past traversal probing, so trying to exploit this uh, uh, well-known vulnerability, uh, trying to do XSS probing, trying to access various uh, well-known backdoors and so on. Uh, and so, um, what happens is that uh, CrowdSec uh, decides that this IP, this is my uh, attacker IP here in uh, Amazon in uh, Ireland, should be banned for four hours because it performed various attack. And the last one being uh, HTTP probing, which is like trying to access a lot of distinct files that doesn't exist on the web server. However, if I go from um, my uh, attacker point of view, uh, I can see that uh, I'm not blocked. I can see access the website because, as I said earlier, CrowdSec is in charge of the detection. Uh, while, in order to be able to react to a component, we are going to set up a bouncer. And so, all the bouncers typically they can be found on the hub. So, I'm just going to showcase a few of them. But if I was using Caddy as a web server, I could use a bouncer directly at my Caddy web server level. If I was using GCP or AWS, I could. Uh, manage directly my uh, AWS GCP firewall rules. If I was using a uh, CDN like Cloudflare, I could interact directly with the API of Cloudflare to take some decision and so on. Uh, or more likely, like in a fail to ban ish uh, setup, having something that interacts directly with the firewall. And uh, as we can see, is that we can even go down into applicative la layers, like we are distributing um, libraries for PHP, even like a bouncer for PHP itself, so that you can install, <coughs> sorry, uh, WordPress plugins that will allow you to write directly at your application level. Anyway, so here what I'm going to do is that uh, I'm going to install a uh, bouncer for, uh, oh, one second, it's bouncer. I'm going to install a bouncer for Nginx. So uh, by doing this, and I'm uh, restarting uh, Nginx. So by doing this, what is going to happen is that now that I have done this, and if I try as an attacker to access my website again, I'm now being blocked. Instead of having a 200, I'm getting 403. Because by adding the bouncer, Nginx has gained the ability, like it sees an IP it doesn't know, it's going to query CrowdSec. CrowdSec is going to say, no, this IP should be banned uh, for four more hours. And so instead of letting the request go through the application, it will block me directly. Uh, for the follow-up of the demo, um, I'm going, <coughs> sorry. 
uh, to delete um, my IP. And so, uh, of course, uh, now if I try to access my website again, I can uh, access it again. So this is simply like to uh, showcase uh, the ability of uh, Cortex a bit out of the box uh, to detect virus attacks and to provide you like a base level security. One might ask how uh, are those uh, scenarios and so on made? So for example, if we are looking at the, um, we are using here, we are using uh, Nginx. If we look at the Nginx collection, it's going to contain parsers for Nginx logs and then a lot of various scenarios. So typically if we are like uh, trying to detect um, someone that is performing, I don't know, yes, HP probing is a good example. It's a typical behavior of a web application in vulnerability scanner where it's going to try to request a lot of various files that doesn't exist, but uh, very often very distinct files. And so, as we can see, all the passwords and all the scenarios, they are very simple YAML files and uh, behind this very uh, fancy website, actually, it's simply um, GitHub uh, repository so that people can contribute and so on. Um, <clears throat> however, as we say, uh, if uh, security is cool, uh, dashboards are often uh, cooler. So what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, set up a small uh, dashboard on the machine. So this dashboard we are using Metabase. For those of you that are not familiar with it, it uh, looks like a bit like a Kibana or something like this. It allows you like to create dashboards on various databases. So here, uh, SQL like. Um, it's going to take uh, probably a few minutes because uh, Metabase is a, a Java software. And actually, how it works is it's simply going to run a Docker um, image uh, containing Metabase and it's going to export us some dashboards. Uh, so, in the meanwhile, what I'm going to uh, show, I think I'm going to take another thing now. Right? One thing that so, um, as we know, there's very uh, there might be often friction between the ops ops people and the security people because uh, sometimes security software tends to behave a bit like a black box or doesn't really fit into what ops people like to be uh, running. And uh, so the dashboard is now deployed. So what I'm going to do is that uh, we are going to um, oh, we are going to go connect on our interface. So, so of course, we are not going to see uh, much stuff in the dashboard because uh, we just deployed the software and we only perform a few attacks. Uh, however, we can see that we can get here some uh, simple observability like with the geolocalization of the attacks, the IPs, uh, the timeline of the various attacks that were triggered and so on and the different kind of scenarios. Um, but as we all know, very often for this kind of software, the main fear for ops people is a false positive. And this was uh, a as something that is rather cool is that, for example, I have my logs of 2019 and I'm still trailing Cortex on to see if it's a proper software. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm simply going to uh, be able to uh, reprocess my old logs from 2019 uh, with Cortex and we can get the log. And by doing so, Crowdtech is going to reprocess the log and emulate the time like it was really 2019. And as we can see, it's here detecting attacks that happened in January 2019. And so what it means is that if I go back uh, to my dashboard and I'm not looking at the current time, but at the past time, typically, I will see here all the events, all the attacks that I saw in 2019 that have been currently rejected um, within the database and I can get observability on it. And what it allows you to do, there are several aspects that, uh, first of all, when, for example, you are facing an attack, you are creating afterwards the scenario so that next time it happens, you can uh, react automatically. You will be able to run it on all logs to see would have triggered false positive, false negatives, and so on. It can as well be useful for people performing forensics or post-mortems by being able to match big amounts of uh, logs again uh, given scenarios and last but not least as well for reporting because everybody loves dashboards and reporting so i'm going to show to stop this and one last thing i want to show is um Crowdsec is uh, completely instrumented for prometheus 
And so Prometheus is uh, something that is very uh, often fancy by ops uh, people, so that you can get a very good observability of what is going on. It can be used either to monitor the software in a general way or even to troubleshoot from a security point of view and then create uh, alerting and so on. So uh, I'm going to go back to my uh, slides here. Okay. So, um, okay. From the demo, it might seem that uh, ProTech is just a, a more fancy uh, fade to band, but actually there's a lot more behind it because all the components that we have seen working today, the agent that passes the logs that does literally the heavy lifting, the local API that converts an alert into a decision, and uh, the bouncers that actually apply the decisions they are all communicating uh, through REST API. So it means that while here we're uh, demoing a very simple setup, people are using it on very larger setups. So with either agents that are being replicated uh, on various machines of the park and all pushing the decision to a central API and so on. Um, plus it uh, interacts uh, fairly well with the uh, other two of the community. So typically it has uh, what we call uh, notification plugins for Slack, Splunk, Elasticsearch, so that you can push alerts from Protect within your CM, uh, or even a generic HTTP API so that you can allow it to push alerts to more or less uh, anything. Uh, so it's API driven, so it's uh, rather oops friendly. Uh, so as I spoke a, a bit about the um, observability with uh, Prometheus, and it's something that is very infrastructure as code friendly, so uh, you can find various uh, script or other like uh, Terraform puppet and so on to deploy it on your infrastructure. And it's something that is rather fancy by a uh, hosters and or uh, MSP. Um, plus, here we are doing a demo on a VM because it's uh, maybe the thing that is easier to understand, but uh, we are all distributing uh, Helm charts and we are currently publishing articles about integration of Cortex within uh, serverless stacks so that you can uh, typically have a bouncer that is not even a firewall, but is simply like a Lambda authorizer so that you can um, literally uh, protect serverless application easily. And one last thing that I uh, didn't show during the demo is that in terms of response, here we spoke only about uh, blocking an IP and so on. But the thing is that in many cases, we want to have a various kind of response. Typically, in a lot of cases, we want instead of simply banning an IP because or uh, banning a whole country because you are facing a very distributed attack, you will want in select, for example, to present CAPTCHA to the users. And you will be able to do this typically using either a Cloudflare Balancer or simply by using uh, applicative libraries that were um, uh, publishing or typically, or for example, uh, WordPress bouncer. Um, last but not least, here we show a rather simple setup, but actually Crotsec scales very well because logs are great for sharding and the architecture of Crotsec with the agent being decoupled of the uh, local API is something that is uh, really suiting for uh, sharding as well. Uh, and uh, last but not least about portability, so as I show uh, during the demonstration, we are distributing Debian packages, but we are as well distributing uh, RPM for uh, so all the CentOS, Amazon, Linux, uh, Red Hat Enterprise, and so on base. Uh, we distribute Docker image, we have FreeBSD package, we even have an OpenWRT package, uh, and uh, we have a Windows um, package, I mean a Windows uh, working uh, version that is on its way. During the demo, uh, we show some rather simple uh, scenarios. It was like a brute force web application, vulnerability scanning, and so on. But given that all these scenarios, all these parsers are very simple YAML files, one can come up with their own scenarios. And this one, I'm going more to share a bit like what we have seen people do with it. Uh, so for those that might not be familiar, um, credit card stuffing is a, a attack, well, not actually an attack, but a, a practice where someone gets their hands on a bunch of stolen credit cards and they need to validate them to know which ones are burned and which ones are still valid. And to do this, they are usually going to simply find the e-commerce actor and validate all the credit cards through their website. The thing is that it's extremely costly uh, for the uh, e-commerce actor. And it's something that is very hard to fight because these attacks are extremely distributed. When you perform this kind of attack, you are usually renting botnets and so on, so that each IP is only going to perform one transaction or only a few requests. And they are strongly distributed. When we speak strongly distributed, it's among the thousands of public IPs address at the same time 
on your website trying to validate credit cards, which is extremely costly. And when you are doing this kind of stuff, trying to find at the IP level, it's completely pointless. It's a botnet, so the machines are spread uh, all around the globe and uh, they are part of everything. So you will need to be able to react at a, a typically at a country level, seeing all of a sudden I have a huge traffic coming from Pakistan on my payment tunnel, this is something unusual, I might want to react. Or at an autonomous system level, if it's more localized. But doing so, you take the risk of simply losing a lot of legitimate customers. And that's why having various remediations, such as being able to inject captchas and so on, is great because it will allow you to effectively mitigate the attack by presenting captchas to the people of the suspected countries while still letting the legitimate users go through the captcha and uh, perform as usual. So this is a more typical example of a rather complex uh, scenario or things that you can fight uh, with CrowdSec. But uh, all in all, the plan is really to have something that is very low force positive and uh, literally no force positive so that it should become a no brainer. You deploy a Linux machine that is going to be exposed on the internet, you will want to deploy CrowdSec because it's going to avoid you some hassle, uh, sending you a lot of um, uh, alerts to your CM and overall reducing the alert fatigue. Uh, and then, so, uh, oh, one thing I want to show, I didn't uh, show quickly during the demo is that, so on my machine, um, I have, uh, oh, sorry, uh, I have taken only one local decision. Oh, and see in the meanwhile, there's uh, someone else that attacked me from a uh, China telecom trying to scan for open proxies. Internet is a dangerous place, people. Uh, but what I want to show is that, so these are my local uh, decisions. However, as I have been contributing by sending information to CrowdSec, actually I received a lot more IP. I have like 800 IPs already in my block list because CrowdSec has been feeding me back IPs from the communities that are very, very likely uh, to attack me. And um, this is what I'm going to talk about. Is that here we are really in a like uh, shell concept. People send information, we send them information back so that they gain better protection and we get more information. It's a um, virtual SQL. And then, but some uh, previous approach on participative security like this trade. And two things that we uh, think are very important to attend to diseases, first of all, like the context. My grandma with her out of date uh, Windows that has been infected by a worm and that is scanning all the remote desktop of the internet. If she goes on the e-commerce website that is running on PHP or Apache and so on, first of all, she's not technically a threat for this e-commerce website because it's not running remote desktop and the uh, worm or the infection of the virus she has only knows how to attack this kind of technology. So there's always about evaluating the compatibility between your exposition surface and the attack capability of the attacker. And that's why when we're re redistributing the IP list, as we're doing here and we're seeing, I'm only receiving IPs that are likely uh, to attack me based on the services that I myself am running and the scenarios I've configured uh, to be running. And then there's a time dependency that in 95% of the case, a machine that attacks me today is a machine that was clean a few days or a few hours or even a few weeks ago. It was an outdated website or running vulnerable software. It got breached and then it's being used to perform attacks. And one day or another, the legitimate owner is going to be made aware that his machine is infected and uh, doing a lot of stupid stuff on the internet. And then he's going to take, hopefully, the necessary step to clean it back. And then the IP will become good again. And so that's why typically in our case, uh, IP that stops attacking for between three days, 72 hours and one week, uh, will be considered clean again because it stopped attacking, we stopped getting signals, and we're going to suppose that very likely the legitimate owner cleans their stuff or the host shut down the machine, and then the IP is going to go out um, of, the, of the database and it's going to be stopped to be distributed. So the plan is really to rather focus on the freshness and the accuracy of the list that we're distributing back on the community rather than trying to uh, pump huge numbers and distribute IPs that are clean for like forever or only did a few attacks and they're actually not a real threat for you. Um, one question that uh, might want to ask when seeing such a project is that how do we deal with poisoning and false positive? Because uh, let's be honest, for us, this is actually is a real challenge. The open source part is uh, something that is, uh, it's not no rocket science, as we say. So what happened is that 
we won't be able to prevent a user to try to poison the system. However, we can make it uh, stupidly expensive so that it's not a viable uh, option because here we're always you know, speaking about return on investment when you are speaking about how the attacker sees because attackers are doing business uh, like, uh, like you do. So all the users, they get what we call a trust rank. So the trust rank is how much we trust the user. Like typically, uh, you install the software, you start to report some things. Your reports are not even going to be taken into account at the very beginning. We are going to wait for, uh, because your trust factor is too low, you just deploy the software. You are, but after a few weeks or a few months where you continue to send information, etc., we say, okay, we don't know if this user is malevolent, but at least he's spending some resources to send us information. So he's using probably some CPU and so on. And he has the possession of a public IP address that he used to send us some information. So it means that there's a cost uh, somehow to do this and there's a com commitment. And then as well, what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, evaluate. So this is a persistent and then we're going to evaluate as well the plausibility because typically we are running a fleet of honeypots on the side and the honeypots for us are various interests. First of all, there were a way to kickstart all the, the whole consensus mechanism and the reputation system. And now there is, well, for example, a great way for us to validate information from new users. I insert CrowdSec, so a very low reputation, and then I report that IP1234 is performing, I don't know, uh, uh, some uh, trying to exploit the latest Apache vulnerability. And then later, this information is confirmed by a honeypot. Then we are going to know that not only I'm running CrowdSec, but I'm running CrowdSec on some real traffic and I've given some information that the system didn't know before. So that my reputation is going to slowly increase. Um, then, of course, we have all the whitelist mechanism because we know that false positive is one of the main fear for a lot of uh, this software. And this part is completely shared with the uh, open source project. So it's a way like to easily ensure that at no point, even if people have misconfiguration, we are going to redistribute, I don't know, uh, CDN public IPs are being, as being bad guys uh, and so on. Uh, and then, and this is a part where we are uh, actually working, is what we call like all the predictive algorithm is that in a lot of cases, you are going to see IPs that have no obvious link altogether, but actually they, be, they belong to the same organizations. They are managed and controlled by the same attackers, but the same group, either because it's a botnet or because it's a, a group of infected machines that is running a specific malware and so on. And for us, one of the changes to be able to identify the weak link between all these signals. And we have seen uh, it typically with uh, groups that were target, targeting some very specific uh, web application uh, where some credit cards were being processed, where you have one IP that comes and does fingerprinting, then you have another IP that comes and uh, that's exploitation. And then you have a third IP that is going to only access the data of the bank door. But being able to create a link and say IP A, B, C, D, L, E, they all work together because you all see them and always see them moving all together is a great information because then you can, uh, let's say, peel the onion of uh, anonymity that is used by the attackers into doing so. And the thing is that we are not naive, we do know that nowadays for a motivated uh, attacker, it's fairly easy and actually fairly cheap to get your hands on hundreds or thousands of uh, public IPs by using cloud providers and so on. However, what is very hard to achieve, and this is what we take massively into account when we uh, decide whether an IP should be shut back to the community as being malevolent, is the diversity of the people that reported it and their individual reputation. And this is all these factors that are put together and that we are putting together that allows us to uh, and the approach that we are using to being able to crunch all these data that is being sent by all the users uh, that we have and eliminate false positives, make poisoning so stupidly expensive that it's not going to be a viable or a useful uh, option before being redistributed. Uh, plus, in case my accent uh, already didn't give me away, but I am French, so GDPR is uh, kind of a big topic for us. And so it's very easy for people to unban themselves as like uh, some forms on the website and so on. And so it's something that uh, tends to be rather open and we're not trying to uh, take anyone uh, hostage. Um, one question that might arise as well is that uh, if everything is free, how are we going to make money and who's paying for all this? Um, so two aspects in this. So first of all, 
is the logs that you process with CrowdSec are never exported. As I uh, said earlier, it's only once you are going to take a decision to ban an IP that you are going to share the IP that you ban, the name of the scenario for which you ban it, and uh, the timestamp. So this is the thing. And then what do we monetize? So for us, we are fairly transparent that this open source software for us is the mean and not the end. Our end target is to create a huge TTI by having hundreds of thousands of machines around the world that are running real infrastructure, real applications, so that we get a level of information that is a lot more relevant than what we can get with a purely honeypots, for example. So this is our end target. And in the meanwhile, we have as well a part that I uh, didn't show during the demo. I don't know if I might still have, yes, not much time, but um, it's a console that allows you like to uh, manage various instances. This is freemium, so it should stay and will stay free for small companies uh, and so on, uh, but in which we are slowly introducing some fleet features that might be more relevant like to companies or organization management, SSO and so on, to try to make some uh, money on the side. But so to sum it up, so how we intend to make money is by being able to sell access to people that want to access to the data without contributing to it, or that want to access all the data at once and not simply what is relevant for them. Uh, so, and this would be my closing words, just a, a few results or a few information. So uh, the V1.0 came out uh, last December. So the project is here fairly, easy, fairly young, uh, but as you can see, we are growing uh, quite fast, we have around 10,000 uh, in South Worldwide, so 110 countries, so we have a huge uh, variety. Uh, over the last three months, we have been seeing around like 700,000 uh, IPs with very strong qualifications that have been blocked, uh, and we are very conservative about what we will distribute, so it's around uh, 3%. And we have a use case across various industries. We have some uh, like hyperscalers that are using it, but as well a lot of smaller business, smaller hostels, smaller companies, and so on. Uh, one of the key points being, as it's a very low technical bar, it's not only targeting security people, but people that run the infrastructure and for which security is something that needs to be uh, dealt with without uh, necessarily having too much human bandwidth to spend into it. Um, and that will be it for me. Uh, I think I'm uh, running out of my time, so yes. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your attention. And uh, if you have uh, any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Wait. There Sorry, we Thibault, we just had to unmute ourselves. No, That's no right. Worries. Okay, so mind absolutely blown here uh, it, so many great things are going on with this tool and the fact that you pulled off a live demo i mean everyone on the chat right now is like super impressed with that i i think what you're showing me was amazing because i've seen a lot of offerings from commercial like for-profit entities and it seems to me that this is more community driven community supported but i mean obviously you're going to make some money with it you know yes. but i i was just amazed at how much it is being done to identify those malicious ips verify that it is a malicious ip and one of the things i've i've never heard in many many talks is about dumping those IPs once they've been rehabilitated mm. or taken down or something like that. So amazing talk. So yes, uh, thank you very much. And yes, the thing is that uh, in our opinion, this has been one of the main issues uh, with a participative project is that if you uh, given like an IP, 90% of them is just a legitimate machine got breached, and you know that some hosters are very uh, doing a lot of due diligence when they receive abuse. Like typically you run things at Amazon, you get a few abuse and if you don't deal with the issues, they're going to shut down your machine. So saying that you are bad, you are bad forever is something that makes no sense even with a public cloud where a public IP address is something that is being permanently redistributed and so on. So yes, for us, it's really one of the key points. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. I'm going to turn it over to Mike and yeah. he has some final thoughts. So thanks, Thibaut. Uh, really do appreciate it. Fascinating topic. Um, feel free to close your Zoom session now. Yes, sure. Thank you.